Welcome back. We want to tell you about a new series of reports that the team at the story thinks is definitely worth your time. It comes from the Oregonian. It is titled Publishing Prejudice. You can see the text on the left side here. It's all about the Oregonian's racist legacy. Now, the series begins with an unreserved apology from the current editor of the paper, Therese Bottomley. She says for decades following its founding in 1861, the Oregonian promoted racist and xenophobic views, stirred hatred, prejudice, and unwarranted fear. Now, Bottomley writes, quote, what the Oregonian published time and time again was objectively abhorrent. The historical coverage was not solely responsible for dis discriminatory policies, practices, or outcomes, of course. But when the Oregonian might have helped forge a better path, it frequently failed to do so. At times, it used its position of power to help lead those discriminatory efforts. Part one of this series a powerful introspective that details some of the things uncovered by investigative reporter Rob Davis, who took a deep dive into the paper's archives, one that began more than a year ago. And I started our conversation by asking him what struck him most as he began this journey. The absolute depth of the uh, hatred and racism that the Oregonians viewed for decades. You know, when we got into it, I, I, I knew that it, the the history was going to be uh, challenging and ugly, um, but it was like that decade after decade after decade, you know, in a state that was founded on these ideals of excluding black people from its borders, you know, the Oregonian helped to amplify and disenfranchise and celebrate the disenfranchisement of uh, black people and people of color, you know, f f through the 1800s, well into the 1900s. So in this first piece, Davis focuses on Henry Pittock, the publisher and majority owner, and Harvey Scott, the editor and minority owner, who together ran the paper from 1861 all the way until 1919. Davis did not mince words. He told me time and time again he uncovered that their work made Oregon a more hostile place for people of cover. One of the most extreme examples, how the Oregonian covered the lynching of a black man named Alonzo Tucker in 1902. Davis writing that it is the quote worst example of how the paper both excused and minimized lynchings into the 20th century. Uh, Alonzo Tucker was a, a boxer and a shoe shiner who lived what is, in what was then called Marshfield, uh, now Coos Bay. Um, he was accused of uh, raping a white woman, uh, the wife of a local coal miner. Uh, a mob uh, tried to uh, intervene after he was arrested. Um, he spent the night hiding on, under the docks uh, along the bay and was found the next morning, was shot, and uh, he was eventually hung. Um, and, you know, the, the newspaper published one dispatch from one of its correspondents congratulating the mob said well done uh in editorials it simultaneously excused the lynching but also said that lynchings were bad that this isn't something that was becoming of places that had law and order um you know at the same time that it's saying we're a law and order place it's saying things like um that the the, the mob acted with quiet and decorum Another thing editor Therese Bonhamly noted in her apology, what she called the unprecedented level of outside review on this series, allowing others inside and outside the Oregonian and outside the usual editorial structure here to read drafts to help shape these stories. So we asked Rob Davis to explain why. Well, I'm a white man and the editor of the story was a white man. And we knew that we needed to um, not only involve our staff involved, you know, we uh, involved our diversity committee. We uh, had two former chairs of our diversity committee uh, who no longer work for the newspaper review the stories. Uh, this was five months ago to help us uh, shape the reporting and to shape the storytelling. Um, we then sent it out to another perspectives panel that we created of uh, five people of color in the community. 
to, again, try to be inclusive in the journalism that we're doing. Um, it was for, for me as an investigative reporter who's not used to a lot of people having hands on my work from outside before I publish, it was absolutely essential. It was a huge learning experience for um, me about the value of, um, you know, the, the inclusive inclusivity in our journalism um, and from uh, tapping those voices that was just absolutely essential. And finally, I asked Davis what he hopes readers in Oregon and beyond take away from learning about the paper's documented and deliberate racist past and how its coverage contributed to some of the challenges Oregon is facing today. We're not responsible for our past. We're responsible for knowing about it. It's the insight that I heard from a uh, uh, black studies professor at, at Portland State as I was getting this off the ground. And, and I think that that is the most important idea here. We are not responsible for what Harvey Scott and Henry Pittick did, but we are responsible for knowing about it. And it's my hope that we can educate our community, give them the critical uh, information that they need to make intelligent decisions, and that this helps to inform that. You know, we all share in that responsibility. This is an ongoing series. One example that is forthcoming, how the paper covered the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Now head to OregonLive.com to read Rod Davis's first piece and Therese Bottomley's apology there because they are both certainly worth your time. All right, keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. We're going to finish this show right after this.